Well, good morning, church family. Uh, in case you don't know me, I'm Kurt Strong, uh, one of the elders here at uh, Faith Community. My privilege to be able to share with you today from God's Word. I was planning on doing this a couple weeks ago. Um, I had surgery. I was supposed to have surgery. And uh, so we kind of thought how many weeks the people were going on a mission trip, how many weeks that would be the uh, I'd be able to preach after the surgery, and well, the surgery got called off. So I had to call Pastor Bob and say, I, I can't preach, sorry. And uh, really felt bad that I let him down in that way, but that's the way it went. And uh, uh, anyway, um, uh, later, of course, I did have surgery uh, June, January 16th. And uh, when I had surgery, the reason why it was called off, uh, I was all ready to go into surgery and uh, all prepared and on the table and cleaned up all that stuff and and uh, doctor came out and said the hips can the artificial hip that they're going to replace you with is uh, contaminated can't put it in deeply disappointed oh my goodness you know uh, it was August 30th when I went in and they said my hip was as bad as someone who was on a walker or in a wheelchair and. Uh, Three weeks later, I was in a walker. You know, I just had been playing a pickleball tournament the week, you know, a week before, so it was just a shock. But it, anyway, my life was changed, and uh, so anyway, but then I got scheduled January 16th. So happy, finally get the surgery, yay! And uh, it went good. No, no contamination, nothing. Everything went great. And uh, uh, anyway, um, and then I got a call from Pastor Bob. Uh, on Thursday, he said, I'm not feeling good. Not, I got sick after this mission trip. I'm not re- recovered like I was hoping to be. And uh, could you um, preach? And I, I sent back a text, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and then I was thinking about it after I sent it, because you know, I was all excited. You know, I, I was disappointed I didn't get to preach. And, and then I, got, uh, I got, get this chance to preach. And, and I thought, well, I'm not happy about you being sick. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't mean to, you know, pass that on to you, I, I, I'm, but I do appreciate it, and I'm very thrilled to be able to be able to do it. And uh, so today I want to uh, preach about living your dreams. Um, after the service, we're going to have that uh, meeting and uh, go over the yearly meeting as we plan for 2024. Well, that needs to happen in our lives, too. Uh, we need to live new dreams. Uh, every year, uh, what God wants to do in our lives. And uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you would help us to develop a vision uh, for our future. Help us to make sure uh, that our vision is your vision and that we're not going in the wrong direction. We're not uh, overlooking things in our life that are, are not good, that need to be taken care of, need to be corrected and that we're not overlooking things that uh, you really want to do special through us. And God, help us to see those things and be ready to do those things. In Jesus' name, amen. Dreams. And by dreams, I'm I'm not talking about, uh, you know, somebody that, um, well, we used to have a a guy in our church. um, His name was uh, Ronnie. And he was special ed. And every now and then he'd come to church and he'd come up to me, Pastor, Pastor, uh, I had a dream. And he'd tell me his dream. And he said, what does it mean? And, and I'd say, uh, did you have, you know, pizza or something the night before? I, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know necessarily that those dreams really mean anything. And I, I don't know the meaning. I'm not talking about that kind of a dream. I'm, I'm talking about a vision uh, that God wants to work through you, wants to change you, wants to develop you to do great things and uh, accomplish great things. And I believe God wants to do that. And so, uh, but whenever I think about that um, idea and this time of year, I always think about Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Oh, King James, that's the way it goes. And uh, um, that's what I think about, you know, uh, Got to have a new vision, or the people do perish. You know, you, you you die out, and you don't do the things that God wants you to do. But that also has a, a context, and and I thought, well, I'll share that context with you today, and uh, that context is dealing with the life, of, in, the, in this case, of a woman, and it just says, in Proverbs twenty nine fifteen, it says, 
the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. When the wicked are multiplied, transgressions in Greece, but the righteous will see their fall. Correct your son, and he will give you rest. This is dealing with the, God's vision as God's plan for that woman is to correct her children. You don't just have children and say that you know, they're really nice and sweet and, and uh, hope everything goes well. You have a responsibility, in this case, to make sure they're doing right, to correct them. And so that's God's plan. And it says, yes, he will give delight to your soul. Where there is no revelation vision, uh, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. And so the message was, mothers, parents, you need to be very careful to correct your children. You, you don't just get to enjoy them. You don't just go to their athletic events or whatever. Uh, you need to correct them. And I can remember as a, a parent, and we, we had four, we lost one, but we end up raising three. And uh, um, we would, um, you know, when they're babies, you know, you, and they get a little older, then you, you might give them a swat or something when they do wrong. And then when they get a little older, our, our, our practice was uh, you, you mess up, you get sent to your room, and then um, when you're ready to come back and say you're sorry or um, ask the Lord to forgive you, and we'd usually pray, uh, then come out. And sometimes they'd go into the room, and sometimes they'd stay in that room quite a while. Um, and uh, my one son, one son, he went by my daughter, who was the youngest one. He went by her room, and he says, why don't you just go out and tell Dad you're sorry? You don't understand, she said. You know, uh, she was rebellious. And, she had a, and anyway, sometimes they'd come out of that room, and then they would uh, say something like, I'm sorry. You know, and of course, well, you've got to go back to that room, you know. <laughs> Today, you'd have to make sure, uh, take, give me your cell phone. You know, <laughs> can't have the cell phone. Uh, but back then, they didn't have cell phones. So uh, anyway, uh, but you have to have a plan. And as they get older, you, you need to have talks with them. You need to correct them and uh, that kind of thing. That's the responsibility. And if you don't do those things, correct your children, you're going to participate in developing a, a bad uh, society. And that's the message. And that's the warning. That's your responsibility. So God gives us dreams or visions uh, to guide us uh, to do things that uh, he purposes for us to do that are very, very important for us to do. Uh, in this new year, as we enter it, it's important that you find God's new dreams for you. God wants, maybe wants you to be a, a better father. Maybe he wants you to start doing devotions with your family. Uh, maybe he wants you to um, look for a, a, a new job. Uh, it could be a variety of different things that God is calling you to do, or be to a better, I'm thinking of as a man, be a better husband, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, but God guides us to do new things, and this is the time of year that we need to be thinking about that, and just like a church needs to be thinking about what's God want us to do this new year. He doesn't want us to repeat the same stuff. He wants us to do new stuff. And so without a dream, you get in a rut, you just go out doing the same old stuff, and you get stuck in the present, and you go nowhere, and God's plan is not to keep you in this rut. Life changes around you. Our world changes. Uh, your family grows up. Your kids grow up. Things change. Your, your children leave, and you become empty nesters, and all that kind of stuff goes on. You've got to adjust, and God's plan for our life, uh, if you don't do this, planning, get in a dream, it goes unfulfilled. You don't do what God wants you to do. Jacob, when I was thinking about this passage of Scripture and, uh, that would go with this, uh, I think about Jacob and his life. And he was a, a young man, and, and he had a dream, and we're going to see that uh, uh, he would uh, have a faulty dream. And so we're going to deal with that. But uh, uh, he was the younger twin of Isaac and Rebekah, very important family. And uh, uh, he had dreams for his future. And he started out with some bad dreams or visions. Uh, he sought to take his birthright. And it wasn't really his. It was his brother's birthright. He was the older brother. And, the, uh, and he was the younger brother. And he sought to take his, younger, his older brother's birthright. And this is found in, Ge uh, in Genesis chapter 25. So if you'd turn back with me to Genesis 25 and verse... Um, 29, I want to read there, and uh, says, this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, his wife, as his daughter, 
uh, excuse me, as his wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. In other words, two children. You have twins. Uh, that's quite a challenge, huh? And, uh, but those two twins, Esau, would become the land of, of Edom. And uh, Jacob would become the land of Israel. And it says, two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. So, and by the way, that's a, a little different. Not supposed to be that way. The oldest is always supposed to take the responsibility. They would get the birthright. That means when the father would die, that would be their job to take over. They would also get a, a double portion of the blessing, of the inheritance. And so that was a, a special thing. And, uh, but here, it's not supposed to be that way, God says. I want the younger to serve the older, over the older. And then verse 24, it picks up. And so when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, and he was like a hairy garment all over, and they called his name Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out, and uh, his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob, meaning heel grabber. Isaac was 60 years old when, he, when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in the tents. Well, that's where they lived, so he was a homebody. Okay, he spent more time with his mother. In verse 28, it says, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. We already see a real problem developing in this home. You say, what's the problem? Favoritism. Favoritism. You're not supposed to favor your one child over another. If you do, uh, it's going to cause problems. It's a natural thing, by the way. You know, Jacob, uh, Isaac really loves this hunter, you know, more like him, and uh, he likes that, and so he spends more time with him, I'm sure. Favored his son, Esau, but the mother favored Jacob. You can tell there's going to be some problems in this home. This is not a good thing whenever you do stuff like that. Now Jacob uh, cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with the same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, uh, his name was called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. I want you for this meal to give me your birthright. You wouldn't think that would be, you'd do it, but here's what happened. Esau said, look, I'm about to die, so what is that birthright to me? Then Jacob said, uh, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him, and he sold his birthright and Jake, to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau that bread and stew of the lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Then Esau despised his birthright. There's something lacking in, in um, Esau. He didn't take the birthright seriously. He would not have been a good leader for that family. And that's why this was planned out to be this way. But this was not planned to be carried out this way. It was done in a wrong way. And God would, I'm sure, have a, a better plan. But that's the way it worked out. Jacob got what he wanted, but he didn't get it the right way. Well, Jacob also tried to steal his older brother's blessing. And the blessing was a special thing. The father would bless his oldest son with a special blessing, and it was a desired thing. It was a, a thing of honor. And so we see in Genesis chapters 27, verse 1, in verse 1, um, it says, Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. He was, you know, almost blind that he called Esau, his older son, and he said to him, My son, and he answered and he said, Here I am. And then he said, Behold, now I am old, and I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons and your quiver and your bow and go out into the field and hunt game for me and make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when he 
Isaac spake to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless it in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring uh, me from the two choice kids of the goats, and I will make uh, savory food from them uh, your, for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it into your father, uh, that he may eat it, and that he may uh, bless you. And before his death, Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. He doesn't look like me. And I am smooth man, skin, smooth skinned, and perhaps my father will feel me, and, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on my life, and not a blessing. He says, This is wrong. I, I shouldn't do this. And, and, but my, you know, why did he want me to do this? And then, verse 7, uh, 13, his mother said to him, oh, We'll cover it. Let your curse be on me, my son, but obey my voice and go and uh, get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory uh, food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes and the elder son of Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And he put the skins of kids on the goats of uh, his hands. He must have been a pretty hairy fellow. And uh, on the smooth part of his uh, neck, then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared in, in the hand of her son Jacob. And he went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Uh, here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau. A lie. A lie. Your firstborn, I have done just as you told me. Please arise and sit and eat of my game that my soul may bless, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord, your God, brought it to me. Lie number two. Once you start in this deceptive life, it leads to more deception. And uh, he credits what God he credits what he did, uh, this deception forgot to God. In verse 21, it says, And Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near me, that I may feel you, my son, whether you really are my son Esau or not. He questioned this. Suspicion, this was a setup. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because... Uh, his hands were hairy like his brother's, Esau's hands. And so he blessed him. Then he said, are you really my son? And he said, I am. Another lie. I'm sure his conscience was bothering him. This is not right. This is not good. And he said, bring it near to me, and I will eat in my son's game, that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near and to him, and he ate, and he brought wine and, uh, to drink. And then his father said, Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and he kissed him, and he smelled the smell of this clothing. And he blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the uh, smell of a field, which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the father uh, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down uh, to you. Be master over your brother, brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Well. Jacob got what he wanted. Now he got the second thing from his brother. He got his brother's blessing. But sometimes when you fulfill your visions, the things that are wrong, they blow up in your face. And that's exactly what happens to Jacob. Um, Esau hates Jacob so much for what has happened because he finds out, he comes in and has the game, and he knows his brother is deceived in his father in this way. And um, 
He is so filled with hatred that Jacob is going to have to leave home. He's not going to be able to enjoy any of those things that he had had a vision for. It blew up in his face. And the suggestion by his mother was to run to Laban's house. It was her brother. He lived far away in the land of Haran. And there he would live until his brother's hatred would pass, if it would ever pass. And so that was, that was their plan. But God had a plan too. And on that, on that journey, we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 28, in verse 10. It says, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba, and he went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place, and he stayed there all night, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place, and he put it at his head, and he lay down at that place, and he slept. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder uh, was set up on the earth, and it was uh, top reached up to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you live, or you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be uh, as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad by the west, from the west to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you, and in all your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you. And will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to the land for wh- wh- that I will not leave you until I have done what I have done, spoken to you. God was letting him know that this is a special place, and he has a special calling for Jacob's life. But it involves some things. It involves heaven, angels ascending and descending, meaning God carries out his plan on this earth meaning that you need to make sure your plans are being carried out by God, not you. In verse 16, then Jacob awoke from that sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I did not know it, but he was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put on his head and set it up as a pillar. This is the place that he's going to worship God. And, going to, uh, and it says he pours oil down on top of it. And he called, on the name of the, uh, uh, called the name of that place Bethel. That means house of God. But the name of the city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in the way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house and in peace. He doesn't want to come back in the same way he's leaving. He wants us to be a place of peace. Then the Lord shall be my God, and the stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. A tenth is a a tithe. In other words, he wanted to give a tithe to God. He felt pressed to give a tithe to God. If God's going to work in his way, his way in his life to bring all these things out to make them right. He says, I'm going to give you a tenth. A tenth man, I, I, I know you're my provider. You're the one who takes care of me. And so that was God's plan for Jacob. But sometimes as we learn our lessons, as Jacob did, It doesn't mean that there aren't consequences. And so Jacob goes on to Haran, and he meets another deceiver named Jacob, the brother of his mother. And uh, he falls in love with uh, Rachel, and he falls in love with her, and he asks permission to marry Rachel. And, of course, he offers to work for Laban seven years and so he works those seven years. And they had a custom in that day, and it would be that the husband would go to his bedroom, and, and uh, the father would bring the bride uh, to his bedroom at night, and they'd consummate the marriage. Well, that's the way it went. And he got his bride that night. But when he woke up, he found out he didn't get Rachel. He got Leah, the sister. And, of course, Laban says, well, this is the older daughter, and this is the custom. I must give the older daughter to you. If you want Rachel, 
you're going to have to work seven more years. And he does that. He meets someone who is a deceiver too, and he finds out what it's like to be deceived, the harm that it does, the bad feelings that it creates. But it doesn't end there. He works for his father, and well, excuse me, for her father. He works for Laban and becomes a shepherd, takes care of the flocks. And, but Laban notices that everything that he touches, God is blessing because he's got this new heart. And uh, so he, he, he uh, puts him in charge of more things and more things and promises wages. And, but then he always is cheating, uh, cheating uh, uh, Jacob. And, uh, but Jacob's learning what it's like and, and consequences. But God keeps turning all those deceptions into blessings. And he ends up with great wealth. And of course, then he returns home with God's blessing. I want to share just a couple of things that I, that I, I see in that story. Uh, first, first, the death of a dream. Some dream, dreams need to die. Jacob's dream needed to die. Uh, some dreams run their course. Uh, we set to do something, and then we do it. Um, maybe it's salvation. Maybe you got saved, and, and that course was, now you got heaven, and it's wonderful. And some people... That's where they stop. They kind of, they wanted this thing and they get heaven. They feel secure about that and they don't really go to church anymore. They don't really serve God. They don't really try to do anything for God. And that's a sad thing. That's not what salvation is meant to be. Um, but that's not uh, meant to be the end. You're supposed to get involved. You're supposed to be active. You're supposed to serve God and live your life differently with this new heart that God has given you. And, and uh, we need to develop dreams uh, as long as we're alive. We don't, never stop dreaming. And God keeps on developing those dreams. And we need to develop those dreams as long as we're alive. And when we uh, stop dreaming, we stop growing. Some people do that. They get to a certain age. They retire. That's the end of their life. Uh, that's no good. I remember when I retired from the ministry after 40 years and started coming here uh, to a different church. You know, my, my wife's family came here, and, and she had spent all those years and 40 years in our church. And so it was, it was a good thing. It was a good transition. And, and then one day, Pastor Bob says, uh, um, you know, you're, you're out of the ministry. Uh, uh, you still got some things to do. And, uh, you know, I knew that. And everybody was asking, what are you going to do when you, you retire? Because you know, I was busy, 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 busy. Um, and all of a sudden the phone quit ringing and things change. Someday that'll happen to you if the, the phone stops ringing. And uh, now you, what are you going to do? And, and so um, would you do this? Would you do that? And each thing, you know, God just brought along. And yes, I'll do this. Yes, I'll do that. And uh, I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to give up. I, I, I'm still alive. I'm, I'm, not an, I'm not that old. You know, I'm 74 now. And I got so many things I want to still do. And uh, you, you just got to keep growing. And... Um, but uh, sometimes people don't do that. And uh, I had a, a dear friend um, who had a family. He loved his kids. And um, he was um, my friend. And uh, he had this habit. He, he, I didn't really know it, but he was living for his kids. And uh, then they got older. And then they would leave home. And suddenly, all of them left home. And he was in a, steep, a deep, deep depression. And I saw this, and I went out and talked with him. And well, what's going on here, you know? And, and he told me, he says, I have nothing to live for anymore. And I, you, you, need, you need to get a new dream. This is not the end. And I tried to talk with him, and he just, 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 just wouldn't listen. And um, that was the end of his dream. Such a sad thing. Uh, hopefully, since then, he's found a new dream. He's got grandkids, so hopefully, by now. You know, he's got things to do. Uh, be careful. You don't run into a dead end in your dream because God always has a plan for your life. Some dreams go bad, like Jacob's. Uh, that is what happened in Jacob's life and um, when he tried to rub his, uh, rob his brother Esau's you know, blessing and also his birthright. Many times our dreams are not God's dreams, especially before we get saved. And uh, our, our, our timing sometimes is, is wrong. Maybe it was the right dream. And that was really the case with Jacob. God wanted him to be the spiritual leader and get that birthright because he seemed to have a better heart. But he did it the wrong way. Who knows how God would have worked it out if he would have waited and had God's timing. We may have started out with good intentions, 
but lost our way. That's kind of maybe the way it was with Jacob. Uh, that's what happened to my friend. He lost his way. He started off to be a great dad, but he ended up, uh, at least when I last was communicating with him, a resentful, depressed dad. Uh, I've seen the same thing happen with um, people um, when they get new jobs. Uh, we had a ministry called Reformers Unanimous, and um, guys would sometimes get out of jail, and, and uh, others would come to it that you know, maybe they were alcoholics or whatever, and they lost their jobs, and then they would get right with God, and, and then they would uh, you know, want to get a, a new job, and, and they'd pray about that and pray about it, and then all of a sudden they get a new job, and we'd get all excited that God is blessed. And they'd work that job for a while, and, and then they got more bills. And then that job wasn't as fulfilling. And, and uh, then they, they're no longer appreciative of that good job. And maybe that boss wasn't exactly the boss that they were hoping for. And, and uh, anyway, uh, it wasn't a blessing anymore. And so that's a sad thing. We, don't need, we need to make sure that we don't allow that to happen to our lives, that, that we appreciate always what God gives us. And when we stray from the Lord, we develop bad attitudes. And that's why we've got to stay close to God during, throughout our dreams and make bad choices when we don't stay close to God. Some dreams do need to die. Uh, dreams are not meant to fulfill our will. Those dreams that are for us, those dreams are not good. They need to be changed or, or die. Dreams are meant to fulfill God's will. So after we get saved, sometimes we need to really adjust those dreams. When they don't, they need to die or we will die with them. Destruction will come into our life like it did with Jacob. And so we need to readjust our life. And so secondly, I want to talk to you about the birth of a new dream. We must not stop dreaming or we'll stop growing. We need a vision for 2024. We need a, a vision for each stage when new things happen, new changes occur in our lives. We need to adjust our lives. We need to make sure we're in God's will and not our will. And so we need to find God's dream. Our dreams are self-focused, just by nature, and lead us to big mistakes because we have weak character. We tend, in truth, without God, to use people, even our children sometimes, like my friend, and um, uh, like Jacob did, use people like he did with his brother. We tend to leave God out when we get what we want. Uh, we are users by nature because we have a spiritual dead nature uh, that we would call a fleshly nature. And when you um, get saved, you don't lose that nature. That fleshly nature stays with you. And you have to stay close to God or that fleshly nature takes over. And so you got this battle going on inside you where the spiritual nature, which is God's leading, and the fleshly nature, which is your leading. And you've got to make sure that God's leading is the one that always rules. And we need to make sure that God is the center of our dreams. And that's how you know this is God's plan. God's dreams always follow his will and lead us to his blessing. His dreams always lead to blessing. Like raising godly kids. That's what God is trying to teach that mother. Uh, and, and a father too, I'm sure that uh, you need to correct your children. You can't just uh, ignore your responsibility. This is a serious thing, and it's not an easy thing. Sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to discipline your kids, but you need to get it done, or otherwise you're going to ruin their life. Uh, and that was what they needed to hear. Uh, like being a witness at work or school. You don't get this new job wherever you, God puts you, and, and you have this opportunity, maybe as a student or as a, a worker, and uh, that, that you love those people that you're working with, that you care for those people that you're working with. And it's not just a job. Uh, you pray with those people, and when you see them going through difficulties, you talk with them about it. You need to be involved with the people, and uh, God will use you in those places. Or like doing ministry. Um, pastor for 40 years we had a lot of different ministries and people involved and moving around in ministries and sometimes you'd uh, hear people that would uh, want to quit a ministry and when you asked them why they said well so and so didn't appreciate my ministry is that why you took your ministry I, I didn't say that but that's the question you know why did you take that ministry you, that's not a good reason to quit now there's some times where you need to change ministries and God directs you to do different things but you ought to make sure it's not a selfish reason. It's not something that, you know, I, I feel disappointed. You know, no, that's not a good reason to, to, to end a ministry. Um, pastors would be moving on quite often if that happened. 
<laughs> uh, we need to follow God in our dreams. Um, this is uh, God's message for Jacob as he saw that letter into heaven. Um, those angels, those were God's instruments working in people's lives, arranging things, carrying out maybe the way that things would have worked out for Jacob and his mom if they'd done it God's way, but they didn't. And uh, he learned that lesson. So we need to learn from those angels that God is involved in our lives as well. God is seeking to lead you in doing his will so that you find his blessing. God's will is that he can bless you, but you've got to do his will to get that blessing. God's will comes as we fellowship with him and as we worship him. Um, God will empower us to do great things in our lives. And what things that you might not consider to be serious or big, you'll find out one day. Those people will make a comment to you, and you'll find out those are really serious things that happen to them because of you. Um, but the challenge of a dream, that's the third thing I want to talk about. Dreams don't fulfill themselves. As a teen, I dreamed about being a NASCAR driver. I didn't get saved until I was 23. So um, I, I watched those races, and I got the strategy all figured out. And, but one day I realized I wasn't going to be a NASCAR driver, and that dream was never going to happen. I never really worked for it. I learned that. I, I didn't work for that dream. And you've got to work for your dreams. You don't just let them happen. They don't just happen is what I'm trying to get across. Uh, I also dreamed as a young man about being a, a millionaire. That was my, my intent. I wanted to be a millionaire. And uh, um, uh, then when my, you know, my wife, uh, well, my girlfriend at that time, asked me to go to church, started going to church, and then I, I'm not sure if I was saved yet or not, but we went to church, and the offering plates were passed, and I put in $2, and then she put in quite a bit of money, and I looked at it, and we were thinking about, you know, maybe getting married, and man, she's going to give away all of her money, and that's what I thought, <laughs> what in the world? And, uh, um, and I, I talked with her about that, and, I, and she said, I didn't even tithe. I said, what's a tithe? I don't know what a tithe is. And she explained the tithing thing to me, and, and uh, uh, so I, I realized God's got to be involved in, in, in our lives, in our family. And so this is God's plan. You know, the, um, we, we give a tenth, and so we, we did. And, we, and throughout the ministry, we gave more than a tenth, and um, that was God's plan. So you, you adjust when you learn new things. We need to make sure that our dreams are God's dreams. Uh, we could end up uh, never doing what God created us to do. Um, you know how many times I thought about being a preacher before God called me? Zero. Never thought about it. Never thought about it. All the way till I was 26 year, 23, uh, 26 years old uh, when God called me to be a preacher. Never thought of that. If I wouldn't have started tithing, if I wouldn't have started getting involved in ministry, I never would have fulfilled God's plan for my life. He said, well, you could have been other things. Yeah, but it wouldn't have been God's plan. Uh, pray for God to reveal his plan for you. And I'm not trying to say that God is calling everybody in to the ministry, uh, being a full-time pastor. That doesn't happen, okay? God calls you to different things. Um, and, and you need to make sure you're doing those things. Seek God's guidance in taking each step. Getting close to God, listen carefully, is more important than what you do. Because if you don't get close to God in your visions, those visions will never work out. You'll never be what you ought to be. We need to next also take steps to fulfill God's dream. Pray for God to reveal his plan and you join him in his plan. That's God's plan for your life. And as you do that, realize that you need to pray and develop this character, God's character, throughout your life. And each thing that you're doing, things don't always work out the way you want them to. Make sure you're getting God's character. Galatians 5, 21 through 23, I always think about that. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, or self-control, or I call it spirit control. And uh, um, the love, that you're loving people, not the way you love, but the way God wants you to love, sacrificially. Sacrificially, you're loving the way Jesus loves. You love those people that are around you at work, in your home. You're not using people. Joy you're supposed to have. Uh, I look at joy as a barometer. Am I doing God's will? Sometimes I, I'm not happy about things. And, and I wonder, what's missing? You know, okay, help me to understand why I don't have joy in my life, Lord. Show me. And God does show me. And he helps me to make sure I'm on the right track. We need to be faithful to fulfill God's dreams for us. And that's 
done with God's character. You got to have God's character. You don't get God's dreams. We need to also expect challenges. Nothing important is easy. We need to examine each challenge for God's message. There, there are challenges that will come to your life. Don't, you know, give up. Oh, why does this have to happen to me? Uh, that, that why question is not probably a very good question. Sometimes it involves loss of a child. Sometimes it involves loss of a job. There are things that happen in life. Sometimes it involves surgery, okay? Uh, we need to examine each challenge. And God, uh, some challenges uh, are, are God's judgment on us, and we need to make sure that we're not doing wrong. I can remember uh, when uh, I found out about that uh, hip, artificial hip uh, being contaminated. Man, I've been waiting from August 30th to January uh, 9th. And, you know, months of my life gone. I never planned for it to be that way. But that's the way it was, and I couldn't do anything about it. I did a lot of reading. I, a lot, I, w I watched pickleball, because that's all I could do, videos. <laughs> I like to play pickleball, so I, I wanted to be able to, when I get better, be able to be a better player. You know, I, I wanted my life to be better, and I wanted to be a better husband. I saw my wife doing things for me, and she, I could see, boy, she really loves me, and I really need to show that appreciation. Um, and then our neighbors would come, and they would do the, the walks when it would snow. And, and um, we had an 85-year-old, uh, um, one of the members of our life group, uh, he agreed, offered to do the snow removal, but he couldn't handle it because it got too, it was, the first snow he had was so heavy. Well, then the next neighbor, he came in, and he did it. God just kept blessing and working out things in our life. And uh, some challenges are God's judgment, though where we do wrong. And so those challenges we need to overcome by getting good character. And some challenges are to guide us as we uh, need to follow God into new dreams. And some challenges are to test our faith. Are we really into this? Or are we just into this for our own selves? Or in, are we doing what we're doing for God? Is this really for God? And that's how you tell. You don't give up. You don't just throw, you, throw in the towel. I want to close with this challenge. Live for God's dreams and not yours. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for this opportunity to, to share your message, Lord. Um, I know that each person here is special. You love each one. They're special, and they don't maybe even realize it. They don't realize what they could do. They don't realize how much could be accomplished through their lives if they would just surrender to you. And seek your dreams. And some of those dreams that they have maybe need to die. They're not in your will. And some of these dreams that they come, that they may have, maybe some, maybe over challenging to them, they don't think they could do. But God, they need to pray. And with your power, they could do far more things than maybe they ever expected. God, I pray that each one today might find a hope in their life, that new things would come into their life, that they could do great things for God. And may that happen to each one of the people that are here today. In Jesus' name.